Uh, next speaker is a uh, yeah Christian Q right okay can you share okay great very nice so so I yeah now it's uh, what forty nine it's uh, ready maybe shall we start yeah we will just by the time start okay so our next speaker is a uh, Christian uh, Kuhn. so can maybe you would, oh he will talk about uh, dynamic system for deeper uh, uh, deeper neural networks. Okay, so let's welcome. So thank you very much. Yeah, I, hope you, yeah. mm -hmm. I hope you can hear me well um, so far. Yeah, very nice, very good. Maybe very can good. you make a full screen? Yeah, okay, should work, yeah. Yep, so very good. So my perspective that I'm going to take in this talk at this conference is maybe uh, complementary to the, to the previous talk in the sense that I am particularly interested in sort of dynamical systems or geometric description of neural networks and how we can actually understand why these things work. So I'm not sort of using them, but trying to really understand why they work. So, uh, so today's plan is the following. So what I will do is I will first give you a brief introduction to sort of my perspective on the field of dynamical systems and their interaction to understand how neural networks actually work. Then in the second part, um, I will actually look at a little bit more sort of actual results that you can do by pencil and paper, how to understand them using mean field theory and uh, dynamical systems that you can still sort of derive by hand. And in the third part, I want to advocate a new approach that we have been developing that's basically trying to make the computer validate that the computer is doing the right thing. So it's basically you rigorously compute and prove a theorem about an algorithm via using the computer um, where the sort of theorem you're proving is something that actually says this and this behavior happens in a neural network. So I think that's a very sort of new approach to uh, how do you actually tackle the field of AI. Um, all right, so first a little bit of introduction. So as I said, um, sort of my background is trying to understand really why these things uh, in AI work. So the key issue is when do modern AI methods actually work? We know now many instances when they do, we know some instances when they don't. And the specific question that I'm going to address is I'm going to look at uh, neural networks. So that, that have really been become sort of one of the workhorse theories and why do they actually do what they do? And so the first sort of statement that I think is relatively clear is that indeed neural networks are dynamical systems. So you can describe them as either sort of uh, flows or iterated maps. And in the end, you want to understand why these flows or iterated maps are actually doing what they are doing in a certain task. So let me set up a little bit of a language. So I will need a network or a graph that I will denote by G with vertices V and edges E. The total number of vertices will be N. Then I will use A always to denote the adjacency matrix. And then every node on this network can have a certain state, Vj, that lives in a certain phase space. You can think of that every node in your neural network has a certain state at a certain time. And then you have basically that there are specialized input and output nodes that somehow make you sort of use the neural network as a function. So basically that it's sort of, you know, you're trying to get a dynamical process to actually approximate a certain function. So there, but there are two dynamical processes that are sort of running that are important. Namely, there's the propagation of information on your neural network. So either via layers or my, via a more general recurrent neural network structure, I will call it information propagation. You're basically sending something from the input nodes to the output nodes, and you're checking what you're actually getting as a result. That sort of information flow on the network. And then there's the learning part where you're adjusting the weights basically of your network to figure out what's the sort of you know, actual approximation or sort of task the neural network should achieve. So there's information processing and learning sort of usually running in tandem. So there are two dynamical systems that are active. And they are coupled, obviously. So the propagation on the network, meaning that you actually have some sort of evolution on the nodes. Um, let me denote by xj um, for now the state of the nodes. Um, so that might be easier because later on I will need the xj as a phase space variable. Then you have some intrinsic dynamics fj of each node, and then you, for example, have coupling between other nodes. So you're basically summing over all other nodes that are coupled to it, and the coupling is done via the adjacency matrix. There are many, many structures and many, many ways how you could write a network dynamical system. This is just one example that I've given that actually propagates 
information across the network if you declare some of the XJs to be the VIN, the input nodes, and some of the XJs to be the VOUTs, the output nodes. But usually coupled to this, there's a process of learning dynamics. So that's the dynamics of the network, the changing of the topology of the network or the weights of the network that I've sort of formally written as some sort of gradient-like structured flow, either stochastic or deterministic, where you're trying to optimize the weights of this network relative to a certain data set, basically. Yeah? So this is sort of a formal representation that you're trying to achieve basically a certain task with the, with the network that ma is mapping input to output nodes. And you're trying to do that by learning some data. And you usually do some sort of optimization algorithm that in continuous time, you can just get some sort of gradient structure type flow, either deterministic or stochastic gradient flow. So as I said, now this is connect, connected to very classical theory in dynamical systems that's often sort of neglected in machine learning. The dynamics on the network would be classically interacting particle systems. You just don't care that what you're looking at is a neural network, but you just care about the fact that it's a network dynamical system and sort of first network dynamical system, all these classical interacting particle systems that have been studied a lot in the 20th century. And the dynamics of the network is basically how you adjust the weights. This will be optimization algorithm dynamics. This also has been looked at from a dynamics perspective a lot, because usually these are schemes that you can interpret then as you start with the value, you try to optimize. And the procedure as you optimize is basically a dynamical process. You're trying to improve it iteratively step by step. So if you combine propagation and learning, that again is so in some sense well understood in, in the community, that this is sort of an adaptive or co-evolutionary dynamical process where these two processes, the dynamics on the network and the dynamics of the network are coupled. All right, so the claim is that I would make is that most current AI or deep net results are in some sense dynamical results we written. So there are lots of links to classical numerical methods, kinetic theory, gradient optimization, asymptotic stability, you just have to sort of reinterpret the classical results about nonlinear dynamics correctly, and then many theorems will fall out. So let me give you a concrete example. So there's this sort of famed um, universal approximation theorem in the, in the AI community that's often attributed to Sibenko and Hornick, 1989, that sort of says that if you have a certain type of feedforward network, for example, with ReLU coupling function, then you can actually show that these functions are dense in reasonable spaces. You can approximate them via these neural networks. But equivalently, if you rewrite this properly, this is just saying this feedforward network is an iterative process of a dynamical system over a certain number of layers over a certain width. And that's just a compositional theorem that sort of is more or less the same as Sharkovsky's theorem for discrete unimodal maps from 1963. And this is very nicely explained in this paper by Sanford and Chatsia Fratis. Um, but there are also many other papers that point this out. Um, where you can actually show that Tchaikovsky's theorem gives you sort of this universal interpolating power. And that sort of re sort of, you can reinterpret that as a universal approximation theorem. And that's actually true for many sort of theorems on deep nets and AI. That sort of, you know, you can, if you look at it at the correct lens, they are effectively dynamical systems theorem. So, so what is new? So what, what if I say, or if I claim that many theorems can be rewritten, there's actually some new challenges that have arisen in the last 20 years where you somehow can't use classical theorems anymore. So a few are practical. These are the first two practical challenges that sort of say, okay, there's new computational power and new big data sets available. But there has been this shift that people trying to understand now network neural network dynamics in large phase spaces and large parameter spaces where large usually means very large, but in practice, of course, finite. And there's a focus on functional behavior, not on all dynamical behavior, meaning you're only interested in if your dynamical system can achieve a certain target and not that sort of it can achieve all sorts of different types of orbits. So the core challenge, the way I see it is actually, if you want to understand modern AI is you have to study large, highly nonlinear and heterogeneous network dynamical systems. And if you can do that, then actually you will be able to understand why many of the practical sort of deep net algorithms actually work the way they do work. So today I will show you two little contributions that we have made that I think are rather nice. So I want to develop mathematical methods that explain me why these large nonlinear and heterogeneous network dynamical systems work the way they do. The first part will be sort of rigorous mean field theory for a, you know, an object called the graph of. I will explain what that is. 
which is basically a pencil and paper theory to, to address this core challenge to understand how large nonlinear heterogeneous network dynamics works. And then the last part in part three, I will sort of have, have to give up my pure pencil and paper work because at some point you can't do nonlinear dynamics purely with pencil and paper, but you can still do it rigorously by using the computer basically to prove theorems about the computer algorithm, which is very nice. It's a sort of new strategy from nonlinear dynamics that we are trying to introduce into neural network theory and uh, jointly with Ellen Aquairolo, where we are trying to sort of get um, rigorous validation algorithms for dynamics to work in the neural network setting. All right. Um, so let's start with this uh, part two, this uh, mean field theory for heterogeneous networks. So for didactical purposes, I will look at particular types of network dynamics, but this particular type of network dynamics, you could substitute more or less any sort of reasonable right-hand side and reasonable network dynamical system that you wanted to. Take your favorite neural net, take your favorite interacting particle system. They are all sort of structured usually the same. You have some individual node dynamics, which I here will denote by theta j, because I will use this Kuramoto type dynamics as an example, where these theta j's usually do denote phases, and the phases are usually on the, on the circle, so they are angles. So that's why I will use this notation for now for didactics, because that's the most classical thing of theta j's, of chromoto like interacting particle systems. And most of these things are you look at your neighbors, you look at all the guys that you are coupled to, and you check which ones you are coupled to by this adjacency matrix HAKN, and then you adjust your dynamics by some interaction function. The classical Kuramoto one would be the sign, but you could write any sort of interaction function G here. And then you, at your next dynamical step, basically you do what is sort of the aggregate dynamics of your neighbors. You can do that in continuous time, discrete time. All of this is more or less, in the end, convertible into each other if you understand the general theory. And let me assume for now that this sort of coupling matrix is actually sampled from a graph. On. So think of it as an LP function on the unit square, and you sample that LP function on the unit square over a grid, and you evaluate it, say, at the center of the grid cell, and at the center of the grid cell, you place a value, and from these values, you're actually getting your adjacency matrix. And if you take this sort of adjacency matrix to a limit, then it's classical sort of graph limit theory by now from Lovac and collaborators from the mid 2000s that tells you that this guy might converge. So you might have that this graph on in the very large limit, if n tends to infinity and you have many, many particles that might converge to a function on the unit square w. Yeah? So and we will use this idea to study large heterogeneous networks by saying, we are interested in doing pencil and paper analysis and the mathematical limit or the vehicle that we are using to do this, we are trying to understand the large scale limit as n tends to infinity, because then we can hope if we have, say, a neural network with very, very big depths or very big width, then if you take the width or the depth to infinity, you could still hope to do something by a pencil and paper. So in these classical Kuramoto type models, um, you can actually then check, okay, if this there's a convergence of the adjacency matrix in a, in a sense, in this graph one sense to a limiting sort of graph object, a so-called graph limit, then you can hope that if you look at the sum that's on the right-hand side of this model, that this actually converges to an integral, yeah? That would be the hope somehow. And the integral would be flavored with the fact that you are integrating over the limiting graph limit, the so-called graph on kernel W, Z, Z tilde, and the sort of U, which is the density of a typical oscillator, which you want to know because that's the mean field limit that you're after, that somehow is involved in a double integral with respect to the coupling function, with respect to how you're coupled to your neighbors, and the typical oscillator then should be described sort of roughly by hoping that you look at this integral formulation. So indeed, this is true. There's a paper from, for example, there are many papers, of course, it's a classical theory. Um, Chiba and Medvedev gave sort of an upgrade of this theory where the AJ K ends are actually matrices and it's not an all to all coupled system. And they gave an upgrade that indeed uh, the Kuramoto mean field limit um, so there should be mean field limit, not mean limit. Last of PDE is actually given by a, a sort of classical first order PDE, a transport type PDE, but with a non-local operator where this alpha in this non-local operator is actually distribution of the intrinsic phases of every oscillator. Yeah? So roughly speaking, what this theorem says is 
you can describe the whole network dynamics in some sense by looking at a typical oscillator. And this typical oscillator has a certain density u. So being uh, at a position theta at time t um, is described by this equation and it acquires an additional index for the heterogeneity because not every node has the same coupling structure to every other node. Now the mean field limit acquires a function u t, u t theta z where Z is actually taking care of how, how you are heterogeneously coupled to all the other nodes. So that's of course very applicable to neural network theory, but there is a sort of problem um, in this sort of structural framework. And the problem that we addressed is that these graphon limits have major restrictions. So graphon and graphing limits are very combinatorial derived objects. And if you want to have them analytically, it can be difficult to deal with them. Many intermediate and sparse graphs are not included as graph limits via graphons, and graphons are integral operators with the density or kernel. So you can define them as an operator that acts on a function and that has a kernel. So basically, you have an object that is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure, which is quite a strong requirement. So you can deal with intermediate and sparse graphs where you might not have actually in the graph limit um this w this sort of kernel and indeed for most neural networks that is actually will be true because most of them will be reasonably sparse or at least very close to sparse because the weights will be very small certain weights so you don't you can't really hope that indeed you can do this in the end with pure graph on kernels i couldn't tackle this problem for a while but luckily um there was a paper that sort of helped me out because people in, in Hungary, uh, Agnes Bakos and Balas Shegedi, they'd written a paper where they proclaimed that somehow you can rewrite all of this sort of graph limit theory in a more analytical framework using operators and measures. And indeed, so they say, okay, we present a new approach to graph limit theory that unifies and generalizes the two most developed directions, namely dense graph limits, so graphons basically, more or less, yeah, and Benjamin Schramm limits, yeah, so these are basically limits of sparse graphs. And they somehow propose a new framework, and that new framework I've made to use, these are called graph ops or graph operators, and these graph operators can actually help you to tackle all sorts of dynamical systems or networks. So how do you do this? So what are graphs as operators? So you fix a probability space and you can think of this probability space as just taking care of the index of your nodes in some sense. Yeah, You place the nodes, for example, on some manifold or some probability space. You consider the associated LP spaces and you say an operator from L infinity to L1 with finite norm is called the P operator and the positivity preserving and symmetric P operator is a so-called graph. Op. Basically, it behaves a little bit, you know, you can think of the adjacency matrix as an example. I will show this on the next slide. And these operators are particularly useful to later on, we shall see, to get mean field limits. So a graph op that's sort of important can also be resented, represented via fiber measures. So you can actually represent similar to the Reed's representation theorem, your operator A, yeah, by as acting on a function as an integral, but via a family of measures. And this family of measures has a nice interpretation. So you know that the space where your family of measures is indexed on that represents vertices, um, sort of the neighborhood um, around this point so around the z gives you the local connectivity so the measures somehow prescribe how your points are locally connected and the product space of omega cross omega basically describes all the edges so you roughly have converted you know the theory of network dynamics or you know if you want to specialize it the theory of neural network dynamics into the theory of into the language of operator theory and measures and then it's of course much nicer to actually work with this dynamically so let me give you some examples. Of course, classical adjacency matrices are graph ops. So you just take the discrete space, um, usual power set, and then the uniform measure. So you place uniform measure on this discrete space. And then you just have um, functions on this space are basically just normal mappings into R. And you take the usual matrix vector multiplication, and then you evaluate that resulting function. And that, of course, gives you, in the end, just that again, this, these ANs are graph ops. They are graph operators acting on functions. These functions here are just act starting on a discrete space and mapping to R, and it's the usual matrix vector multiplication. Graphons are also actually then in the end uh, graph ops. 
So you can also show this. So you basically take a function here. You, for example, can take zero one or some more complicated manifold if you wanted to take the usual Borel sigma algebra, take Lebesgue measure, and then you see that the graph one is an integral operator is also a graph of it's acting as an operator on functions, for example, on LP functions. Even more nicely, you can cover all sorts of graphs that you can cover with graph ones or, or graphing limits. For example, you can cover graphs of intermediate density, for example, the spherical graph. Here you take the sphere, for example, the two sphere, take the uniform measure, and then you define your graph of via its fiber measures by saying you take the uniform measure on the grand semicircles that are orthogonal to a point. So you pick a point, you take all the other points that are orthogonal on the grand semicircle, and basically the edges between the points in some sense are then inserted whenever you are sort of orthogonally connected to a point. This is actually a graph of intermediate density that's neither sparse nor very dense, but it's still a graph. Of, so it's still a graph operator that you can treat and you can take limits and all sorts of stuff. All right. So for very general graphs, we can now actually get mean field limits. So again, for illustration and didactics, I will just consider these classical Kuramoto type models, but you can do this in principle for any network dynamic model, as long as it has a reasonable structure where you basically have a node. And on that node, there's some intrinsic dynamics here. The intrinsic dynamics is very simple. It's just a rotation on the circle with some frequency. And then you actually get some sort of coupling to other nodes and you get information on how you should behave from the other nodes via some sort of summing up what the other nodes are doing. And again, we want a blast of mean field PDE for the typical position of an oscillator at a certain time within this heterogeneous network. So there's two viewpoints that you can now have. In graph of theory, you can actually take these adjacency matrices and you can make them converge as operators to an infinite graph limit operator, which I denote here by infinity. And you actually sort of convolution type integral that you get in the, in the mean field PDE that describes on the mean field limit, for example, your neural network, but it could also describe you know, an epidemic network or a social network or a mean field game or whatever have you. You could describe that then via this mean field PDE and then you see here that in this sort of integral before I had sort of this convolution kernel W, but now the actual graph of limit acts directly on the density. So you get a very natural sort of generalization to heterogeneous intermediate and sparse structures. And you can actually also do this via fiber measures where the fiber measures then become more or less most generalized versions, you're basically integrating against all the fibers. And depending on which fiber you are, you basically get an entire family of mean field limit PDs. So basically how heterogeneous you are determines how big your system of mean field PDs becomes, which is actually very much applicable to neural nets because in some sense you anticipate that if they really in the end are tractable, they should not be too heterogeneous, but they should also have some heterogeneity. So you expect somehow some reasonably low dimensional subspace in Z to govern the final mean field dynamics of your PDE. So you might wonder these PDEs that you get from network dynamical systems, are they actually you know, reasonable? So do they in some sense approximate these finite dimensional systems when N is finite but large? And are they well-posed PDEs? And indeed, um, you can show that. So you can actually show, I will give this only as informal statements and refer you to the papers for all the technical conditions that are very long to write down. You can actually show existence, uniqueness, continuous dependence, and the finite dimensional approximation of the particle system for these mean field limit loss of PDEs um, for various classes of these Kuramoto-like and more generalized models via graph of operators. And we used in this first paper graph on approximations and harmonic analysis techniques to prove this. And we need to keep careful track of certain norms and metrics to figure out that we are indeed approximating the finite network dynamics by this infinite dimensional PDE. In the second sort of sequence of papers, um, sort of the first one was Ms. Mario Skokas, the second one was with Chuang Chu. We actually proved existence, uniqueness, and continuous dependence, but using measure theoretic viewpoints. And we used purely fiber measures and avoided all graph on theory. And we were able to prove again the existence of a well posed blast uh, of limit PDE. And we even recently have extended this from graphs to hypergraphs, yeah, which is very nice. Then we also proved that we can do this for full sort of neural network type models where actually you not only have the dynamics on the network, but you have the dynamics also off the network, meaning that you have some adaptation of the weights via learning. 
So this third theorem, we have two papers on this. I only cite the continuum limit paper here, which is a slightly different variant of the mean field limit, but we can also do the mean field limit. There's another paper that we have on the mean field limit where you can show that indeed, if you couple in optimization, for example, or any sort of other adaptation in the variables on the weights, at least for a certain restricted class of adaptive or co-evolutionary systems, we can prove that again, we are allowed to pass to the limit, which is then a PDE that you can hope to analyze and which you can hope to understand to figure out what your neural net, for example, is doing. Yeah. And we can also then, if you have that limit, you can analyze it. You can do stability analysis, numerics. You can actually figure out what this is doing. You can figure out when, for example, a certain network achieves a certain synchronized or desynchronized state. And you can test your theories about your finite particle systems via pencil and paper methods that are applicable to, applicable to this infinite dimensional limit. So in this first part of my talk, um, I hope you have seen that um, there's sort of this, you know, dichotomy, I would say, of, you know, trying to really push, but when you push, you need to take advance, uh, sort of uh, advantage of the limit as n tends to infinity. Suppose you didn't want to, suppose you said, okay, most neural network algorithms are finite in the sense of you have a finite neural net, despite the fact that n is large, and you really wanted to prove a rigorous mathematical theorem about network dynamics for finite networks, yeah, finite, but n being big. Yeah, so the neural networks suppose, you know, in practice are finite size, but very large. They are highly nonlinear, despite the fact that, you know, if you look at something like a ReLU, it tends to fool you to think, well, it's, you know, linear there and then linear there, and it's not so bad. But once you start iterating and combining, these are, of course, highly nonlinear systems, so don't be fooled by this. And they are primarily used as computational objects, so often it's even difficult to access what people are doing in the computation, and that's just the algorithm available. So how would you do a pencil and paper proof to, for example, validate that the neural network is doing the right thing that you wanted to do or not wanted to do? And usually then you have to give up with your pencil and paper arguments. So for such dynamical systems that are not sort of small, that are not very large, where you can take a limit, which probably don't have many symmetries or special structures, pencil and paper proofs are usually out. You can't do this because it's far too hard. People tried for many years for other types of dynamical systems, and usually this fails. I mean, if you assume a lot of structure, you can prove something, but you, if you assume relatively little structure, then you can't prove anything. Yeah? So the key new idea that I want to propagate in this last part of my talk is, if you have such a practical case of large where you can take limits, then you should rephrase this neural network problem still as a dynamical system, you should rewrite your dynamical systems problem as a root finding problem. And then you should employ modern techniques that allow you, allow you to rigorously validate via a computer that to this zero problem solutions actually exist. And then you should translate the results back to your original neural network behavior. So basically this is saying we want to use the computer to prove what the computer is doing, but we want to do it rigorously. Yeah? Sounds a little bit mad in the first place, but if you think about it in more details, actually, I think a rather creative approach. So as I said, this is joined with, with Elena Kroyrolo, a postdoc of mine. So let's think of an example. Let's think of a typical standard neural network architecture. Let's do discrete time for now, but we can also, we will convert to continuous time later on. So suppose you just have sort of a layered structure where you have input layers, output layers, and hidden layers and you have some activation function, sigma, and you have some adjacency matrix that in the end you want to optimize maybe over and you have some bias. And you want to understand what this neural network is doing. Suppose we're given some function sigma and given some A and given some B, what's the dynamics that this thing is having? And if this is large and finite and some large but finite D, it's usually extremely difficult to prove that. Yeah? So today's example, let's just take an example that we took from the literature. Let's just take Tanch as an activation function. And as in the previous talk, I will switch to the neural ODE viewpoint. And if you take and plug epsilon Tanch in, and then you do take the, the xt minus one over to the other side, you divide by epsilon, take epsilon to zero, then indeed you can go to continuous time. You basically get the neural ODE viewpoint. Yeah. So the question now becomes, what does such a neural ODE do? It looks innocent, but for a general large parameter space of A and B, it's actually very difficult to prove by pencil and paper what such an ODE is doing if D is particularly large. Yeah. I mean, even if you could do it for this special case, the more nonlinear and the more high dimensional you make it, the more complicated it will become. 
So how do we attack this problem? So first, let us fix the A. We took a paper of Chang et al. from a couple of years ago where they fixed a certain A that's not primarily relevant. All that's relevant is that for this A, there's actually a sampling going on for some matrices and there's a parameter or the neural, neural network people would say hyperparameter. This hyperparameter gamma will be our main bifurcation parameter. So we are interested in what this neural network is doing if you are varying gamma. And what we want to show is that actually it can happen that if you vary this parameter in this neural network, this dynamical system has lots of periodic orbits and has actually a very complicated orbit structure, which of course means already dynamically it's pretty dicey because lots of periodic orbits already hint at high sensitivity of your dynamical system. So let's set F to be our right-hand side vector field from this neural ODE that I had. And let's suppose we wanted to get at the periodic orbits by proving that Hopf variations exist in this system. Yeah? Of course, you could try to do everything by hand, but as I said, the larger and larger these systems get, the more and more complicated it becomes to validate these conditions rigorously by pencil and paper. So you would want maybe a computer to tell you that there's a Hopf bifurcation. And from that Hopf bifurcation, the theory actually tells you that there are periodic orbits that are bifurcating off when you vary gamma. So that means you can validate the existence of periodic orbits if you can validate um, the existence of Hopf bifurcation and shoot suitable non-degeneracy conditions for the Hopf bifurcation. So how would you do that? So um, let's suppose the first Hopf bifurcation condition you need is that you have an equilibrium point. Yeah, suppose that it exists and you know for what parameter values it exists, which just means your right-hand side vector field is vanishing. Suppose you also can calculate the eigenvalues. So what you want is to have a complex conjugate pair of eigenvalues because that gives you the Hopf main Hopf bifurcation condition that the pair of complex conjugate eigenvalues is passing through the imaginary axis upon variation of the parameter. Um, to make this sort of a little bit nicer as a numerical wood finding problem, I will also normalize the eigenvectors. So the eigenvector will be V. I will take really an imaginary part for this complex eigenvector. And then I will write it as real normalization conditions and I will normalize that eigenvector. Yeah. So now the validation of Hopf bifurcations is effectively a root finding problem because if you look, you have to find and solve lots of equations that actually tell you, okay, basically there's a big set of equations that have to be zero. And if they are zero for a certain gamma, then you have a non-degenerate Hopf bifurcation. Or you have a Hopf bifurcation, then you have to show that it's non-degenerate by computing a certain thing called the first Lyapunov coefficient that you can also validate. Yeah, which you can also get via a zero problem. But roughly speaking, validation of Hopf bifurcations in the end upon variation of the parameter becomes a big root finding problem. Yeah, so you have to, you know, show that a certain function that you have defined for a certain value of gamma actually has a root. And indeed, many dynamical systems problems, and in principle, I would say most of the interesting questions that you could ask about a large scale network dynamical system, you could also rephrase as a root finding problem. Yeah? You can find other types of bifurcations, periodic orbits, homoclinic orbits, invariant manifolds. With the postdoc of mine, we even looked at stochastic cases. So even for stochastic systems, for example, for minimum energy paths, you can still rephrase after you worked a lot all these dynamical systems existence problems for large scale but finite systems into root finding problems. Yeah, So you can sort of take your neural net and you can reformulate the dynamical question you are asking about it as a root finding problem. Okay? So now the problem is you have this root finding problem. How do you actually ensure that in this root finding problem you actually do find solutions and you can sort of validate what your dynamical system is actually doing? Yeah. So, and here's one way to do this, which is the sort of recent sort of a posteriori error estimate idea that many people recently have been using, which I think is very powerful. So you're trying to use a Newton Kantorovich type argument. So the idea is you take your root finding problem. It could even be in the end, an infinite dimensional root finding problem. If you wanted a periodic orbit, for example, that would be useful, yeah. And suppose you have a numerical solution that has a certain error that you have computed. So you have found that indeed your Hopf bifurcation problem or some other problem for your neural network indeed has a certain type of behavior. So suppose you had a value where you knew that the Hopf bifurcation numerically would be occurring. And the trick is now, this is of course only a numerical validation that your actual neural net is doing something that maybe like a Hopf bifurcation where you vary a parameter and then it starts becoming periodic. To actually prove this, you have to show that indeed this root finding problem has an actual root. Yeah? So that means 
In addition, you have to define what's called a Newton map. And the Newton map is basically you look at something that's in the vicinity of this numerical solution. You do an iteration via an approximate um, linearized inverse at this point for this root finding problem. And you have to show that that root finding problem has a true solution. So near the numerical solution, you want to show that indeed, for example, there's a true Hopf bifurcation point or a true periodic orbit or a true invariant manifold nearby. Yeah? And there's a theorem that sort of tells you there's hope to do this because if you look at this sort of Newton map, um, then you, if you can show certain conditions, if you can show that indeed this Newton map is sufficiently well behaved near the fixed point, so you have some boundedness, and the Jacobian is sufficiently nice behaved relative to a certain increasing non negative continuous function rho, and this function rho satisfies certain bounds, so there are bounds on this function rho. Then indeed you can show via basically the Banner fixed point theorem that T has a unique true fixed point in a ball near the numerical solution. So roughly speaking, if you can validate these conditions rigorously, then indeed you have shown that near the numerically computed solution, there is a true solution. And um, we can do this. So there is actually ways how you can actually partially analytically and partially numerically check these conditions, but the numerical checking of these conditions is done via interval arithmetic. So it's completely rigorous if you use interval arithmetic to get some numerical bounds, for example, on a Jacobian. Yeah? And if you do that, then you actually in the end have a theorem that says, indeed, there's a true Hopf bifurcation for this large scale neural network. And without you ever having to sort of pick up really, you know, very detailed pencil and paper calculations that are hopeless, you only do the minimal amount of pencil and paper setting up that you can do. And the rest, you let the computer prove the estimates that shows you via interval arithmetic and this newton Cantorich method that there's a true um, Hopf bifurcation point in the vicinity of your numerical solution. All right, so what we have shown with Elena is actually in a preprint and that's on the archive, um, that if you take, for example, all sorts of matrices, you would just sample some adjacency matrices randomly, you can take reasonably large dimensions. If you had a bigger computer, we can also take, you know, a couple thousand dimensions that should be very easy. And we validated Hopf bifurcations as well as the first Lyapunov coefficient at Hopf bifurcation that tells you whether a stable or unstable periodic orbits bifurcate off. We can validate hundreds of the things and we can actually show that in this neural network architecture, hundreds of unstable periodic orbits bifurcate if you vary this parameter gamma that was our quote unquote hyper parameter. Don't like the hyper in front, but it's the main bifurcation parameter that we varied. So roughly speaking here, we plotted just a few of these periodic orbits over a certain time. Of course, they're unstable. So you see them, um, if you just do forward integration, you see them sort of diverging from these two unstable periodic orbits. And this sort of tells you that the original neural network that we started with, sort of this guy, can probably produce, under very reasonable assumptions, lots of periodic and unstable periodic orbit behavior, which sort of hints already at high complexity, which is expected because, in some sense, we know that these things should have high expressive complexity. And indeed, in dynamical systems, is well understood that if you have, for example, chaotic dynamics or high expressivity, in some sense, then you should find lots of periodic things. And we indeed do that, but we don't sort of postulate them. We actually prove them rigorously using a computer, which is the sort of nice thing. So we apply this Newton Kantorovich type stuff to prove these things. All right, so I think now I'm almost done with my time, I think. So I have a couple of minutes, one or two minutes left for, for summary. So what I try to argue is that many methods for neural network dynamics already exist in dynamical systems to understand them. So you can use dynamical systems techniques for neural networks. What we have been focusing on recently is really the frontier for network dynamical systems and trying to understand you know, the limit n tending to infinity very well, because that's probably for heterogeneous systems not very well explored yet. And this is what we are missing to really tackle two neural networks with pencil and paper, n tending to infinity, and then trying to analyze the co-evolutionary or adaptive resulting mean field PDEs. And then the second part I've shown you, if you want to do practical stuff on finite but large systems, I think the only real way how you can give a rigorous mathematical proof in many instances if you make sort of very little assumptions is actually use the help of the computer to prove something. So the idea of rigorous computations for neural network dynamics.
So, all right, for more information and the papers and references, you can go to my website. You will quite easily find what the papers are. As I said, the last part is a recent preprint on archive with Elena Quairolo, and the other papers are works with Chuang Chui, Mario Skokas, and Eric Martins and company. And then I'm finished and would like to thank you very much for your attention and the invitation. Okay, very nice. Okay, thank you very much. So any questions, comments? Yeah, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah very nice uh, question. I enjoyed it. Um, the uh, complexity I'm still trying to grapple is both for your first part and your second part. So in the first part, when you're looking at um, neural network dynamics, and especially with neural ODEs or maybe neural SDEs, then the uh, joints are very uh, unstable. So I was wondering, you know, what are you capturing in your mean field PDE? Is the learning of the dynamics, which is the shift in the parameters, but they are being updated by unstable uh, joints. Uh -huh. So, yeah. So how was how is the uh, because the learning process is not only learning the forward dynamics, but le you're learning the forward dynamics using a, a backward, a joint or um, mm -hmm. system. So right? that's actually something that we are in some sense working on because currently um, you see that these equations here um, capture in some sense the propagation on the network only. So that would be with fixed weights, right? So you haven't learned anything yet. So the weights are fixed. You haven't done any learning or any adjoints or any whatever, yeah? But then if you would say that these AJKNs, if they are dynamic, so you actually give them dynamical equations, so you learn them, say, by an optimization algorithm or you learn them via whatever method you are planning to learn them, adjoints, whatever optimizer you want to use, then what you get is a coupled dynamical system. You get one dynamical system for the A's, so for learning the actual weights of the network, and you get one dynamical system for the propagation of the function that basically your network is defining. And currently what we can prove is that for certain restricted classes of these sort of, sort of coupled systems that are technically correctly called, I think, adaptive or co-evolutionary networks where there's learning and information propagation. We indeed have a mean field equation. And the mean field equation for the learning is some sort of rather ugly measure driven or measure sort of centric differential equation that is very difficult to write down here on this slide. And we only can prove this for certain sort of special classes of learning or special classes of evolution for the A's. So you are correct that if there's a complicated dynamical process that may be sort of highly unstable and complex, then indeed it would be quite interesting to see how this in the end shows up in the mean field equations. But we haven't done that yet. So um, you are absolutely right. That could be looked at, but we haven't done it yet. And just as a follow-up, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, on your second part where you reduced it to a root finding problem of some perhaps complicated uh, function f of x, uh, the, you know, the fact that uh, small perturbations in the coefficients of your reduced f of x can lead to large variations. So especially with half bifurcations as you're trying to capture uh, in, even mildly chaotic systems, um, you know, where you have like in aerodynamics, wind tick vortices and so on, you're not only getting an isolated uh, bifurcation, but you're getting a whole system of bifurcations which are very closely together. So with your numerical solution, then uh, I'm, you know, questioning as to uh, how do you separate and tease them apart? <laughs> If there's not an, if the root finding problem per se, that the dynamical behavior you're interested in, you convert it to a root finding problem. If that root finding problem per se doesn't have a nice isolated root that you are trying to find, then you have to maybe think about more generally and think, okay, if there are more roots, then you basically have to find an entire manifold of these roots, right? So because, you know, the more sort of degenerate becomes, the higher and higher dimensional of the roots will be, yeah? And of course, then you can rephrase the pro problem instead of just finding a single root and finding sort of entire manifold of the solution. Yeah? 
that's also possible. You can compute things like invariant manifolds where the root finding problem is basically a function. So you're not trying to find just a point and you're not trying to find a value, but you're trying to find an, an entire function in a function space. And of course, you can also write a root finding problem on a function space. And I've made sort of careful note of the fact that indeed you can do this on Banach spaces. So if you have actually an object that's higher dimensional, you can do the whole thing in Banach spaces and people have done like in classical sort of fluids applications, for example, even validation of very complex solutions in, in turbulent and Navier-Stokes type flows where the computer has, has been able to prove that there exists these very complex solutions. So indeed, this if you phrase it correctly, I think this is one of the few ways how you can rigorously mathematically prove the existence of very complicated objects, but you are correct that the more complicated the object of the sort of root finding problem is, the more care has to be taken. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Excellent, very nice. Also, uh, just in closing, uh, can you give my best and very best regards to your colleague, uh, Barbara Walmuth? Sure, uh, sure, I will. Yes, so. I can do that. <laughs>